Hi, everybody. I'm Julie Woodward with the Oregon Forest Resources Institute, and it's my pleasure to be your host for today's Tree School Online webinar. Tree School Online is a production of the OSU Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Program, the Partnership for Forestry Education, and the Oregon Forest Resources Institute. We appreciate contributions for this project by the US Forest Service and the Oregon Department of Forestry. Thanks for joining us this month to discuss forest amphibians. Uh, many of you have probably joined in before in a Tree School Online class, but just a couple housekeeping things let you know how where some things are set up. So the Zoom toolbar should be located on the bottom of your screen. Sometimes it's on the top. And we'll use some of those features throughout this. Um, your audio and video is turned off for all participants. You'll just see our presenters and the host today. We ask that you, um, any questions that you'd like to ask, if you'll type those in to the Q&A box, you'll click that on and we'll be monitoring that throughout the webinar. We'll have one break in the middle and then times for questions at the end. The chats, there'll be uh, Alicia Christensen is helping monitor that today. She's with OSU. And we're going to be also, um, if you have a general comment you want to send, that's fine or if you're having a problem. But again, please put those questions in the Q&A button. We do have a few resources we're going to mention today for this webinar. And those can be found on the Tree School Online class guide page, which can be found on the Tree School um, page on knowyourforest.org. Alicia will also be sending you that link. You just click on the webinar description, it'll take you to those resources. And we'll also share some of, of that um, with you throughout the chat. This webinar is being recorded. They uh, will be archived as YouTube videos and accessible from the Tree School Online pages. We have almost 50 Tree School Onlines in there. To, you can go back and launch a lot of uh, depth of information in there if you're looking for other topics. We'll also use a poll at the beginning and end of this, and um, it should pop up on your screen. If it doesn't, you can just click on polls and that'll pop up and you can answer those questions. And we appreciate your feedback for today's webinar. And as mentioned uh, today, the presentations on getting to know forest amphibians of Oregon. And that's going to be by Deanna Olson, Tiffany Garcia, and Fran Caffrata Co. And it's my pleasure to introduce those three today. And Deanna or Dee Dee Olson is the research ecologist with the US Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station. And she studies the conservation biology and population and community ecology of amphibians. And her current projects address the effects of forest management practices and riparian buffer width and threat factors, including the climate change and diseases. And Tiffany Garcia is a professor at Oregon State University in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. And she's been mainly working in seasonal streams and ponds, studying the impacts of environmental stressors on amphibians. Her research quantities, um, behavioral, psychological, and community responses to environmental stressors, including pharmaceutical contamination, invasive species, and climate change variables. And Fran Caffredico is the owner of Caffredico Consulting and a certified wildlife biologist. She works hard to bring forestry and wildlife researchers and practitioners together to manage for wildlife and forestry in the Pacific Northwest. And we're excited because these three authors came together to work on a project with OFRI, an education project to put together a newly released publication on the wildlife and managed forest, forest amphibians. So a lot of what you'll hear today has been part of this new project and I'm excited for them to share more about their research, about things they um, learn as they put together this publication and just all the great things they see when they're out in the field. So Fran, I'll hand it over to you to tell us more about the presentation today and the publication. Thanks, Julie. Hello, everybody. So glad to have so many people signed up to learn about forest amphibians. The three of us, uh, well, I guess the five of us, the hosts and the presenters are really excited to share with you today. And so this slide we have up right now is the front cover of the new forest amphibians publication, if you haven't seen that already. So that's what we're going to be going through today. And then in, that's available both online and in print. So you can download it or order it. And of course, that's a free um, order from OFRI and they'll be happy to send it to you. And I just noticed that all of that has been popped into the chat for you. So that's quite quite easy. You could even you could open it and follow along if you if you wanted to. Um, and then so today specifically, we are going to um, really introduce you to the amphibians that are found in Oregon forests. There's been a lot of recent science that continues to add more depth and detail to the body of knowledge about amphibians and their response to forest management. 
And so scientists like the my two uh, co-presenters here today are learning a lot more about the importance of smaller habitat features like substrates, like gravels, cobbles, boulders, and especially downwood and microclimates and the relationship with predators and prey and competitors and com competitors and streams, patterns of movement, um, resiliency to disturbance. There's just a, this huge accruing body of knowledge that's painting a more detailed picture about amphibian response to forest management and um, contributing to new best management practices that we can integrate into our forest management plans. And so today we want to, um, you know, focus on that. H hopefully you'll walk away with um, being really jazzed and excited about forest amphibians like we are, and um, with some ideas about what you can do on your own properties um, to help these little guys. Julie, we want to do the poll. Thanks, Fran. Yeah, so we'd like to jump in here and, and launch a poll, and that should pop up again on your screen for all participants. And if you don't see it, you can just hit polls. But there's five questions. They just are a multiple choice. And what we'd like to do is just get from you. Um, where are you from? That helps us know where you're coming from today. About yourself, are you a woodland owner, a private natural resource professional, agency, or nonprofit? Um, you might, how many acres of forest land do you own or manage, if any? And then we've added in a few amphibian questions today. How familiar are you with our regional amphibians? So not very familiar. Somewhat familiar, you can identify a few species or very familiar, you're a naturalist and uh, love seeing the amphibians when you go out and able to identify them. And then where do you see most uh, of your amphibians if you do see them? Is it in the streams, ponds or lakes? under logs, other places, or have rarely seen any amphibians? So um, we'll just take a minute and let you answer those questions and then we'll share that. And again, it's helpful for our speakers, but it's something that we also like to, to help track of where people are reaching us for the Tree School Online webinars. So again, we appreciate your time today. Um, we know there's a lot of different choices you have and we appreciate you coming in and joining us and listening to this topic and learning more. And so it looks like we have most of the people are coming in from the Willamette Valley area, some on the coast, some in Southwest, Central and Eastern Oregon, and then some from Washington. So none outside the US today. We're keeping a little more local in Oregon. And then, uh, and then about yourself. So let me uh, share this with everyone. Um, so you can see these along. So you can see we have a, a primarily here in the Willamette Valley area, and then we have quite a few woodland owners, 45%, and then we have resource professionals and then others who are just very interested in the topic. So always appreciate that interest. Uh, we have all acres of site class represented. Um, you know, 40% don't own any forest lands, but then we have them all the way up 3% that have over a thousand acres. So a wide variety of landowners with us today. And it looks like you have a lot of people here who are not very familiar or somewhat familiar and only one brave said very familiar. So uh, I'm hoping by the end of this that they'll know that they probably know more than they realize, but uh, glad to see everyone can come in. And then where do you know most often see amphibians? That seems uh, again, pretty across the board, but with ponds or lakes leading the way on that. So thanks everyone for joining in the poll and we will have another one at the end today. So I'll hand it back over to you, Fran. Awesome. I liked that last question. It was kind of our trick question on where you see amphibians, because of course you would see them um, in all those places. <laughs> so that's really great. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Didi. Thank you, Fran. That was a great introduction. And I'm, I'm glad to get a little bit of a profile of um, the, the people watching today, and that'll help us as we go along. Um, this. This slide is showing an overview of the amphibians that we're going to talk about today in Oregon. And so let me just orient you to the, the image. Um, in the background, you see Oregon with different colors. And those colors are showing the different ecoregions of Oregon. And the ecoregions are based on a composite index of um, geology, climate, and vegetation. So these different areas are, are essentially provinces and the amphibians have associations with these different environmental conditions. There are 31 species of 
amphibians that are native to Oregon. And um, they kind of are divided up into east side and west side elements. Let me talk about the east side element first. Um, there's fewer amphibians on the east side because it's drier and those arid conditions are less suitable for amphibians, which really have um, a moisture dependency. But the ones that live there can seek out those, those moist, wet areas. And um, four that I really think of as being iconic of the west side are frogs. Um, they're in the Blue Mountains are the Rocky Mountain tailed frogs. There's tailed frogs on the west side also, but this east side um, element, the Rocky Mountain tailed frogs go into Washington and Idaho as well. And, um, and then the Columbia spotted frog um, occurs across the east side and it has a complement on the west side, the Oregon spotted frog. <clears throat> the Great Basin Spadefoot occurs on the east side. It is really associated with areas like Ponderosa pine forests and sandy substrates. Um, we'll talk about some of these species in a little bit um, as well. And then there's several species that are somewhat peripheral to Oregon, but they just barely get into the state. And one of those is the northern leopard, leopard frog. So these four frogs are somewhat iconic to um, either continental distribution like the leopard frog um, or the east side conditions of Oregon. But on the west side, uh, we have more forests and more moisture. And so there's quite a few more species on the west side of Oregon. And the west side, I'm talking about the Cascade Range, um, the Willamette Valley, Klamath area, and the Coast Range. <clears throat> Many of these are really associated with the forest habitats. And so that's, of course, our focus today. Um, there's 23 species that are forest associated on the on the west side. So that's 23 out of the 31 total for Oregon. And of those 16 are salamanders. So we have this, this really um, uptick in salamander diversity there on, on the west side. So I think I'll leave it there and we'll go through some individual species um, in a minute. Um, yeah, great. This is so much fun, right? We get to talk frogs with, with our friends. Um, okay, so this slide is another one of those big kind of two-pager um, overwhelming slides that it contains lots of information. Similar setup as the last one where you've got Oregon in the middle of there, but instead of the eco regions, it's really just um, an elevation map. So here we're just trying to um, outline all the different habitats in which um, amphibians are often present. So forests are all over Oregon, but those forests differ somewhat. And within these forests, you've got lots of different habitat types. And you'll, you'll find different species of amphibians within those habitat types and those different forest types. Um, so lots of opportunities for diversity and um, speciation. So that's why we we're an amphibian hotspot. Um, so I guess this breaks down to kind of a life history lesson where you've got these three big categories for amphibians. You've got the terrestrial um, salamanders, you've got the pond breeding amphibians and the stream breeding amphibians. And um, they're all cool in their own ways. Terrestrial salamanders don't need to lay eggs in water, which is weird because when you think of amphibians, you think like they lay their eggs in water and that's how you identify them. At least that's a, a, a good trick for doing it. But these terrestrial salamanders, they, they lay their eggs in moist, places like in logs, uh, but not in ponds and streams. And so they, you can find them far away from streams and from, um, and from ponds deep in these forests. And so that's what we, we see a lot in these, in these forested systems um, is, uh, is, are these terrestrial salamanders. And we'll talk more about the different types because they're amazing. Uh, then you've got these um, stream breeders, right? And you get different species in the small streams uh, versus the big streams, right? Because the small streams, you get some really cool headwater uh, dependent species. And in these large streams, you've got to have amphibians that can hold their own against salmonids, right? So that's a different kind of amphibian. Um, and then these, uh, the talus slopes and the downwood are really important habitat components um, 
for for protecting salamanders and frogs and and toads uh, from from conditions that aren't great, like uh, like freezing conditions or when it's really really dry. Um, so you'll find amphibians kind of deep inside these habitat features, deep under a bunch of rocks and these talus slopes, or deep inside these downed wood um, stumps and logs uh, to protect themselves from drying out. So. Um, and so these are the, just the different types of places or habitats in which you would find um, some of the amphibians that we're going to be talking about. And as we go through these different species descriptions, we will tell you where and what habitats you you should look um, you should look in in order to find them. Okay. So let's start with potentially the coolest group of salamanders out there. These are the torrent salamanders and there's three of them in Oregon. There's four of them within the complex. The fourth one is up in the Olympic Peninsula, but these three are, are in, in Oregon and you can kind of tell their distribution by their names. So the Cascade Torrent, it, torrent is in the Cascade Mountain Range. The Columbia Torrent kind of follows that path of the Columbia River um, all the way out to the coast. And then as you go down the coast, then you get into where you find the Southern Torrents. And these guys are headwater stream specialists. So you will find them where the rivers begin and the streams begin. And they are, um, they're, a, they're of conservation concern. So two of these species are currently being looked at with a lot of research program, programs, including a, a one of Didi's and a one of mine, where we're um, trying to assess their distribution and their abundance in these streams uh, because um, they, uh, as climate change affects uh, headwater streams and those types of habitats as they dry up, these torrents uh, could potentially be in peril. So we're very interested in torrent salamanders. And if you get Didi and me talking about this, it could last about an hour and a half. So I'm gonna keep it to that, uh, but they eat lots of stuff in headwater streams. We, um, we find them in the seeps near these headwater streams. We're doing environmental DNA projects to try and find them a little bit easier just by sampling the water. And we're looking to see if um, there are some climate refuge areas around the, around the state where these species might persist as, as uh, climate change progresses, where we're, we're sure that some of these populations um, are gonna make it. Um, so yeah. Then the next group of species is another amazing uh, two species that hopefully you've seen and hopefully you've screamed when you've seen them because they can be terrifying. They're so big. These are the giant salamanders and they were, it's an apropos name because they can get very, very large and they're biphasic, which means they live in, in streams and rivers. They have an aquatic life stage and they have a terrestrial life stage. So they lay their eggs and then they develop as larvae with feathery gills that pop out of the sides of their heads um, for a, a large period of time. And then they can metamorphose into adults and live on land. This is a really interesting group because they don't necessarily have to live on land if they don't want to. So there are certain um, uh, conditions in which they can metamorphose and become sexually mature but still retain their gills and still be able to live full time in the water. So it's just a weird life history kind of tweak that you see in this, this group of salamanders. And it just makes them so fun to study. Um, there's quite a few, there's lots of research that's going on with these guys. We've been tracking their populations in areas of Oregon for upwards of 20 years. We've got data sets that go way far back in terms of population uh, distributions and abundance. They can get really big. Right, so in terms of like the in in the streams, they can can compete with salmonids for prey. They they are competitors with cutthroat trout, which there's not much that can compete with a cutthroat. Right, so you got to be impressed. If anything impresses you in this person, it should be that. Um, and there's uh, and when they become terrestrial, they can they eat whatever they can fit in their mouths. Right, they're gape limited, so they can eat quite a few quite a few big, bigger objects. Like definitely their prey range is much bigger than other salamanders just because of but to the nature of their size. Am I forgetting anything about this particular group, you guys? 
because they're so fun and there's so many cool anecdotes like when you take people out into the field and you're tromping around rivers and you find one and you bring it up out of the water and everybody you know, these seasoned people are just like oh it's so big it's so much fun to freak people out with them um as a side note just real quickly uh we caught we were electrofishing in the rock creek area and we caught about a hundred of these things in just about a mile of stream. So their densities can be pretty high. And those 100 varied from little, little ones that were uh, probably um, less than a year old all the way to the very, very big ones. Okay, now we're gonna transition to other types of salamanders. And um, Tiffany was talking about the torrent and the giant salamanders that are stream breeders. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about terrestrial breeding salamanders. So these are salamanders that do not need to go to any kind of water to lay their eggs. They have a life history that is entirely terrestrial. Um, there's some shown here, the Dunn's salamander, Larch Mountain salamander, Western Redback, Del Norte and Siskiyou Mountain salamander. These all are in the genus Plethodon. Um, plethodon are lungless salamanders. They are, these are woodland salamanders also. They're highly, highly, highly associated with forests of the west side of Oregon. Um, some have small distributions. For example, the large mountain salamander occurs um, up by Mount Hood in the Columbia River Gorge, and then it extends into Washington a little bit up the Cascade Range. The Siskiyou Mountain Salamander also has a, a very restricted range in um, the Siskiyou Mountains. So uh, down by Ashland, south of, of Medford, it um, occurs uh, on our side and also the California side of the mountain range at the border of Oregon and California. Um, Del Norte Salamander is along the coast um, from uh, about Coos Bay South. So their distributions are are very complementary, and um, what we've seen is that these animals have um, diverged and have restricted ranges. So there's very little overlap between many of the different species. Dunn's salamander and western redback salamander do overlap their distribution if you look at the map. But if you go to a site, you'll find that oftentimes their microhabitats are quite different, with dun salamander often being within 50 feet of streams, and western redback salamanders often being associated with um, rocky slopes. So they, they use um, those interstitial spaces that are created by the talus or the rocks um, in the, on the forest floor. The Del Norte and the Siskiyou Mountain Salamander and the Larch Mountain Salamander all rely on talus slopes, whereas Dunn seems to be almost semi-aquatic being nearby streams. So these are, um, these are salamanders. They, have, uh, they lay their eggs in the substrates um, and their eggs develop into little miniature salamanders. So they don't have a larval stage. They go from egg to a juvenile that looks just like a salamander and then the juveniles grow. So they can be from, you know, quite small when they hatch from an egg, and then they get to be about six inches long. Um, all amphibians, they are carnivores. They eat live prey whenever it can fit in their mouth. And Tiffany was talking about being gape limited. So how far their mouth can gape whenever they can fit in there, they will eat. These guys are smaller than the giant salamanders that um, Tiffany was just talking about. So they eat smaller things. And in the leaf litter, for example, of the forest floor, they will eat beetles and ants. And, and um, in some cases, um, it's thought that these animals, um, what they're eating is forestalling the leaf litter from decomposing. And actually, it, it has a link to climate change because it's, um, it prohibits that leaf litter carbon from being released into the atmosphere. So it's interesting. These guys could have a link to forestall carbon by their carbon sequestration. Um, 
maintaining the leaf litter from degrading by those leaf eating bugs in the leaf litter. Um, let's see, they don't have lungs. That's an interesting thing about the, the plethodonted salamanders. They breathe through their skin. Um, and let's see, any other, what did I miss? Bump, 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 bump. Oh, they're low mobility. They don't move very much. So a conservation implication for these is that um, they require patches of habitat that are somewhat continuous uh, for their, for their um, sustainability. And they can live maybe 15 years. So these guys are getting somewhat long lived for an animal out in the forest. So the climbing salamanders are related. They're in the same family as the plethodon that we just talked about. They're in the plethodontid family, um, meaning that they're lungless also. But um, this is a different genus. And uh, the climbing salamanders um, have the ability to climb out of the forest floor. And some of these are found in trees. The clouded salamander, for example, um, has been found up in Douglas fir trees associated with red tree bull nests. And um, there's other species of climbing salamanders in California that have similarly been found up in trees. The, the black salamander here, the Klamath black, um, is not normally found in trees. Um, it's associated with the forest floor and um, a rock associate, but it does use down wood as well. Um, just a few years ago in 2019, the black salamander was split into several species. And in Oregon, in Southern Oregon, the one that lives um, along the Siskiyou Crest is the Klamath black salamander now. And then further south, there are different black salamanders that have been um, broken out based on both their genetics and their morphology. But this is a good lesson that we're still learning about the diversity of salamanders in our region. And as um, our uh, technology develops and we can look at their genetics better and we can understand their physiology and their, um, uh, their morphology, uh, we're looking at them and, and several species of salamanders have been identified in the last couple decades. So for example, um, Tiffany just talked about torrent salamanders. They used to be one and now there's four of those. Similarly, the black salamander, there used to be one and now there's four. Um, they're very similar. They, they eat the same sorts of things, uh, small arthropods, bugs on, on the forest floor. Um, down in the Siskiyous, it can be dry and warm, and these guys are found near um, streams in that area, um, but they also are found in some rocky uh, developments also. I think this is our last group of plethodontid salamanders that we're going to talk about. These are the slender salamanders, and there is an Oregon slender and a California slender. And if you look at the, the bodies um, of these two animals that are shown in that image there, they look like worms. And so they're just long and slender. Um, these guys are associated with down wood. So even within the terrestrial breeding group, there's divergence in the different types of habitats that they use. And these guys are highly, highly associated with down wood. And you can see that there are eggs um, and that one individual is curled around several eggs. Um, these eggs are laid in the downwood and uh, it's thought that the, the mother curls around the eggs and guards them, um, makes sure they don't get diseased and keeps away other salamanders that could um, potentially eat the eggs. So here, I don't know what if there's an interloper coming in ready to eat those eggs um, or not, but usually it's um, just the mother that is tending the eggs. So there is parental care in salamanders, which is sort of a more highly evolved behavior, right? Um, so the, they are similar, they're gape limited predators. They're gonna eat whatever they can find and the uh, down wood is a little ecosystem with um, all kinds of spiders and centipedes and mites and 
snails that are associated um, downwood retains moisture. So moisture dependent organisms will be there like the mollusks, the snails and slugs could be there. And these are prey for salamanders. Um, so the Oregon slender salamander occurs in the um, Cascade Range. It has a restricted distribution only from the Columbia River um, down to mm, maybe Roseburg or so, almost, no, not quite Roseburg, I believe. The California slender salamander is in the South um, Coast Range and it goes into California. So they have disjunct distributions, um, but they're very similar in that they're low mobility. They don't move very far from, uh, from these logs and they're highly associated with, with the downwood. Tiffany, did you want to add anything on the Oregon slender? Well, I well, I, I actually there is um, back on the climbing salamanders. So uh, there's I have a go back. <laughs> do you, do you I, I have this uh, colleague who is trying to survey for cladded salamanders, and it's pretty weird to have to climb a tree to find a salamander in Oregon. And so what he's doing is number one, he had to take a tree climbing class where you know you're all like harnessed in and you've got all the ropes and everything and which is something I would never do and then he um he's putting these these uh kind of mats the uh these they're called cover boards arboreal cover boards but they're not boards they're more they're more pliable and he's strapping them around the trunk of the tr the, the the main trunk but up in the canopy a little bit and he's going to try and he's going to check them every couple of weeks to see if these climbing salamanders are hanging out in the canopy and he's going to count them and and see like how many trees they're on and all that kind of stuff it's a really interesting novel survey technique that um that is just being developed somebody's doing it down in humboldt county and so he's going to try it up here and with the Oregon slender salamander, yeah. So when I I, bet, I have had a research project on that for about ten years, and when I first started doing it, I went to Didi and I was like, "How do I find this salamander? Because they I can't find them, and because they're really they're really they can be tough to find. They um, they're down underground or in this downed wood for most of the year. They pop up for a couple months in the spring and a couple months in the fall. And so you really got to time it right. And when you do time it right, though, you find them. And it's like for a herper, this is the unicorn species of Oregon. It's the, in fact, it's the only, correct me if I'm wrong, Didi, but I think it's the only um, salamander that you only find in Oregon and nowhere else, right? It's the only endemic yeah. salamander that we have, right? That's right. Yeah. So uh, we should have a stamp with this on it. We should have... <laughs> We should have books with only the Oregon slender on it. Oregon slender is truly a special Oregonian type of a species. Um, we put out cover boards, uh, pieces of wood on the forest floor and hoped that these animals would populate it so we could find them more easily. It took forever for the, an Oregon slender salamander to show up at our cover boards. And I think that's because they find good places to live and um, they don't move very much. Um, but once they did populate our cover boards, then uh, we marked them and we could, we found the same individuals over and over again. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. We've been trying, we've been looking to see if the, if timber harvest has a, an effect on uh, the, the uh, Oregon slender salamander. And now we're looking at in wildfires. So we're up in the Beachy Creek fire and the Riverside fire. Oh, good. If, um, if they are, are persisting in these after a fire, which we hypothesize that they are because they go underground and soil is a great insulator for fire. And we think that the, um, the Oregon slender salamanders are just heading underground. A uh, little fun fact too, uh, Dave Wake, who, it, who was a uh, fabulous um, uh, taxonomist for, for salamanders uh, said that in a in a conference that uh, that the Oregon slender salamanders have the slowest metabolic rate of any vertebrate on the planet. Wow. Which if you're going to believe anybody, it should be Dave Wake, I think. When it yeah. Comes Years ago, there was a fire, the Waldo Lake fire, and um, Oregon slender salamanders were found in um, patches of downwood that that um, fires are often skippy. It you know there's places that just don't get um, 
as intense uh, burns. And in those areas that were less intense and the downwork was intact, the, um, the slender salamanders persisted. So. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. The next one I think is Ambistimatids. Yeah. So now we're into the mole salamanders. Uh, so there's three species of mole salamanders you can find here uh, in Oregon, the long toad, the northwestern, and the western tiger. Long toad and northwestern are pretty common. Like these are the ones that you would probably uh, be able to identify um, pretty quickly and easily. They're pond breeders. So they're on the west side of Oregon. They are um, in the coastals, in the Willamette Valley, up in the Cascades. If there's a pond, then you should be, and no fish, you should be looking for long toed and northwestern egg masses in um, late winter, early spring. They're very different egg masses. Uh, the uh, northwestern salamanders have lay these eggs that are, in, and they are a ball, and it's like a size of a softball, and it be, it's really sturdy. Like you could pick it up and move it around and then put it back. I you probably shouldn't, but you could do that with northwestern. Uh, and and long toed salamanders, they're smaller egg masses, uh, but these are really cool species because they're, again, biphasic. They lay they lay they lay their eggs in ponds. They uh, are predatory uh, salamander larvae, and then they metamorphose and they go out into the world. But what's cool is that they always come back. So they come back to the natal pond, the place where they were born, and they lay their eggs in that pond. So. If you come back at the right time, you can see all these adult amphibians coming back, laying their eggs, and then you watch as those eggs hatch and uh, the uh, larval salamanders eat everything and then uh, and then grow up in metamorphose and 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 transfer out to terrestrial lifestyles. Um, they the western tiger. I've actually never seen a western tiger in Oregon. Dee Dee, have you seen one? Fran, have you seen one? I get pictures sent to me all the time asking what this thing is, and it. Um, I've had several Western tiger pictures sent to me and in unusual places like Sun River, um, Oregon, or yeah. are, are on the road in Bend. So um, yeah, they're out there, but they're, I think they're, um, we just don't know where the populations are. We, we see scattered individuals. Yeah, I, am not, I haven't been lucky yet with that. Um, but the other mole salamanders, like the long toes and, and the northwesterns, you can find them all in a lot of different places. There, you can find them tra traversing over grasslands. You find them all over in woodlands, um, and conifer and conifer forests, and um, anywhere where there's a pond, you're probably going to find these guys. And just as a, as a side note, so the long toes salamanders, they're really weird because down in the Willamette Valley, they lay their eggs in these masses. So they've got this little kind of jelly ball filled with you know, 10 to 25 eggs. But if as you go up into the Cascades and you get onto the crest, they lay their eggs singly. So one little egg, another little egg, kind of in a little area, but one at a time, which is super weird for an, one species to be having different kind of population um, reproductive strategies. So I have no idea why that is. They also have, re they have, they can exist. I, I've heard tales that there is a population in the caldera of Broken Top that I would love to see someday if I ever became a snowshoer or whatever, I would go. There's some interesting stories about lots of these different amphibians. Um, a population south of Sisters of Long-Toed Salamanders occurs in a pond that dries up occasionally and the conditions get really quite um, harsh for the salamander larvae as the pond is drying up and at this site there the, the larvae uh, need two years to develop into um, a terrestrial form so they have to make it through that dry summer to the next year uh, to get through metamorphosis the second ear larvae are carnivorous and they are cannibalistic and they will eat the young of the year, the, uh, the first year larvae. They develop fangs <laughs> and big heads. Um, and then when the conditions get good again, the heads shrink and the fangs go away. So they are, have a very plastic life history and um, 
I've always I didn't wanted know you to be the expert that you are. I was there. You were making that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always wanted one of the local breweries to do a, an October beer of, you know, the fanged, big headed, you know, scary Halloween salamander. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> I would buy that beer. <laughs> but the, the consequence is there's recruitment out of that pond every other year. Um, because when you have the second year larvae, they eat everything in the pond and only the second year larvae metamorphose out of that pond. But the next year, there is only first year larvae and, and they survive as well as um, frogs that are in that pond will survive that year. So it's like every other year they have a boomer bust life history. It's crazy. Yeah. Stories of the salamanders. <laughs> I know it's dangerous to get us going on this. <laughs> I'm going I'm to move us forward to the Encentina salamander, which um, is, is a bit more common than the other ones we've been talking about. This might be one that uh, folks could put in the uh, in the chat, maybe that they've seen. But the Encentina, um, they can really withstand drier conditions. Um, they're more visible to folks because they are out and about more often um, and a little more mobile because of that ability to withstand um, drier conditions. We kind of think of it as your gateway salamander. So maybe we should have put it up at the at the beginning of the presentation. It is it's an easy one to identify. Um, they do have a lot of different color variations um, and are found um, throughout throughout Western Oregon. So, you, you know, this picture we have here is, is one, one that they look at, they can be a lot more yellow, they can be a lot more dark, they can have um, just like a lot of different colorations. One of their cool um, things that they do is so if when a, encountering a predator, they will, they can drop their tail um, and leave the tail behind to do its little waggy bits and then um, they can regrow it. But when they have to do that, the, and hopefully the Encentina obviously escapes when they, when they have to drop their tail, but it will never be quite the same after that. It's, you know, once they've lost their tail, it, you, you, if you catch one that um, has that constriction right at the base, you'll be able, you'll be able to quickly tell that it's lost its tail before. Um, I don't know, is there anything, any anecdotal stories from the two of you about Encentina? I mean, you can find these in wood piles, like in your backyard to, to out in the woods, um, what, you know, certainly under duff and under logs, it's a good one to look for on, on the family properties. So, and then are the other, are you probably like, are they gonna talk about the rough skin newt? We are, it's included in the book, definitely probably the most iconic forest <laughs> amphibian um, that uh, people are certainly very, very um, familiar. And one of the things that I learned from my co-presenters here recently was that, that I think people will find uh, really interesting is that they are finding them in the stomachs of um, barred owls through the barred owl studies that have been going on. You might've seen some of those in the news where they're doing research on barred owls to try and see about that interaction between um, barred and spotties. And um, so some of the Anyway, finding out that they're eating rough skin newts. And the reason that is so interesting is because, of course, this species is quite toxic. Um, in fact, like uh, there's enough poison in one adult. Uh, I just read this. Ladies, correct me if I'm wrong, but can kill, kill up to 25,000 mice. So the one enough toxin in one salamander to do that or one newt to do that, which is crazy. So um, we put that big red caution on there. You know, I've definitely spent my youth handling uh, handling these critters, but I can also tell you, and I think my parents are listening today, so they'll get a chuckle. I mean, I was always, you know, wash my hands, don't touch your sandwich, you know, make sure you get those hands clean. And, and that's really true. So if you're going to, you know, handle these, um, you want to be careful. And that's actually true of handling any of the amphibians, you know, they, their skin is really important. And so when you, if you touch them, which is very, you know, you, you're going to want to do it, you know, your hands should be clean and wet. Um, and then you should wash your hands afterwards, which we're all quite accustomed to washing our hands these days anyway. So that shouldn't be too bad. But anyway, these guys, you know, they're, they're quite mobile as well. Um, and one of the coolest things about them is when they encounter a predator, they do this whole, because their underside is the warning sign, that orange color is the warning. So they do this whole like arching push up kind of deal to expose as much of that underbelly as possible to warn off predators. So they're quite, quite cool. And um, I think the lesson there is you should always listen to your mother. <laughs> Yes, that is definitely the lesson. <laughs> I certainly uh, still do. So um, let me see. I'm just going to, I think that's, 
I feel like that's no, that's not the last one. Of course it's not. We haven't even talked about frogs. All right, we better better move through. Yeah, I'll speed up a bit because I know we have some um, forest management slides to get through in a minute. So um, tailed frogs, iconic for the Northwest. Um, we talked a little bit earlier that Rocky Mountain tailed frogs occur on the east side and coastal tailed frogs occur on the west side. Um, these are stream breeders. They, they need the stream for laying their eggs and larval development. They have tadpoles that live in the stream. And then after metamorphosis, they go up to uplands. So they are truly um, in the water and throughout the upland forest. So these um, have those two different phases of aquatic and terrestrial existence. Tailed frogs are the most primitive frog period everywhere. <laughs> their nearest relative is New Zealand. Um, I won't go into their primitive characteristics, um, but their anatomy and physiology is um, ancestral to all other amphibians. Um, in the stream, the tadpoles have a sucker on their mouth that allows them to suck onto the rocks where they will um, uh, prey on the algae. So the, the tadpoles are um, omnivorous. They'll eat things on the, on the ground, on the floor of the streams. But once metamorphosis happens, then they're um, carnivorous like all other amphibians. Next slide. I think we're getting into all the, the frogs and toads now. Great Basin Spadefoot is in the eastern side. They, um, they're one of the only amphibians that actually digs and that's um, uh, why they have this name Spadefoot. All other amphibians use cracks and crevices in the ground surface um, under logs or in rocks, but these guys can dig a hole and they live underground a lot of the time because they cannot tolerate arid conditions or cold conditions. So they come out when it's cool and moist in the spring they're pond breeders. They lay their eggs in ponds. Their tadpoles develop very quickly. Um, and then uh, they disperse uh, mostly through areas like ponder ponderosa pine forests and open areas um, associated with shrub steppe. Western toads are my fave. I started studying Western toads back in the day. 1982. Oh my gosh, it's been over 40 years. Um, I could I could talk a whole hour about these, but um, but I won't. Um, they're fairly common in uh, high lakes of the Cascade Range, although their distribution can be anywhere in Oregon. Um, I don't know of a single site in the Willamette Valley where they have been found, but they are known from um, Central Coast Range of Oregon. Some um, sporadic populations here and there. Um, these guys seem to be really susceptible to a lot of different threats. And, um, and so a lot of amphibians, it's not just uh, forest management that may be a concern, but there are other things. And this one is susceptible to disease. We're very cautious about um, exposing it to several uh, types of diseases. There are um, water molds that infect the eggs. There's fungus that infects the skin. Um, so we, we're being very precautious and trying to maintain um, most of these amphibians from different types of threat. And climate change may be a threat for some of these species too if their habitats are changing. So what's left? Tree frogs. Ooh, tree yeah, frogs. Tree frogs. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So real quickly, I mean, you probably don't need much of a of an overview on tree frogs because these are the frogs that we all see. We see them everywhere. They're uh, pond breeders and hear frogs. them and yeah. hear them. They're the only native frog that vocalizes above water. So we can, as soon as you hear the little chirp chirp of of a of a of a Pacific chorus frog, you can, you can um, localize your, or, um, you can find your way to the pond and you can see a million tadpoles and you can see um, breeding adults and it's all very cool. Uh, I guess the only thing to say here is that they're pretty common. They, um, they are biphasic, so eggs, larval, adults, and they are different colors. So the, you can, you can get a little bit wigged out because you can see some that are kind of brown. You can see some that are green. You can see some green that have brown stripes and vice versa. And there is a fabled blue morph that exists somewhere. I've never seen it, but I hear it exists. 
And then the, I think this might be the last of the, besides the bullfrog, the last of the native frog slides, which are the true frogs. So these are ranids. These are frogs that, um, interestingly enough, most of these are of conservation concern. So we're losing a lot of our ranids here in Oregon. Most of them um, are, uh, our pond breeders, we have some that do breed in rivers. So the foothill yellow-legged frog does lay its eggs in rivers. And these guys are, um, they're very susceptible to different types of threats, similar to the Western toad. Uh, they overlap with the Western toad and the Pacific coarse toad a lot in terms of distribution. So if you go to a pond in the Cascades, you will often find the Cascades frog up there hanging out with Bufo and with, or with the Western toad and with the Pacific coarse frogs. If you go in the Willamette Valley, you'll often find um, a red-legged, right? So these are, uh, they, they look very similar. Uh, you often have to um, kind of know where you are in order to distinguish between these different species. And uh, when you do find one, uh, consider yourself lucky because a lot of they're, they're disappearing from a lot of their historic range. So, and we, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about invasive amphibians, but I have to give a shout out because I believe my nephew who is pictured here is listening today. This is an old picture. He's going to be like, oh my goodness, I've grown up quite a bit since then, but he's pictured here holding the invasive bullfrog, which was in, um, so doing his part to get it out of the system there. And, uh, but one thing I will say about the, um, the invasive species here is that they are still a very good education tool. So they're, you know, they're common, obviously you can be able to find them. You can talk to people about, um, about the bullfrog and, and how they compete with our native species. They, they will eat fish. They're just, they're excellent competitors, right? So that's why they are doing so well. And uh, there can be a, um, you can eat them. So if, you know, if you see a bullfrog, uh, they do vocalize, of course, you'll know if you're hearing them, this is that big, deep noise, maybe, Maybe Dr. Garcia or Dr. Olson will make that sound for us if we're lucky. And <laughs> they're like, no, we're not doing that. So, um, but one issue to be aware of is that there are other um, invasive species that are um, of concern. So to be aware of the African clawed frog, um, which has been found in Washington. Um, typically the way these get introduced into our systems is through the pet industry. Um, so, you know, be sure to uh, pay attention to that and, and be you know, mindful of, of that and, and not, we don't wanna spread um, invasive species. So, so that uh, we feel like that was a very quick introduction to the species that are in Oregon. So we want everyone to take you know, that quick stretch break and we're gonna do a few questions right now. So I think Julie is gonna come back on and, uh, and she is already and walk us through some questions. Yeah, so great information, a lot of good conversation, people asking questions. We'll go um, through a couple of these. Please keep putting questions in. We'll have hopefully time at the end to go through some more questions. So if you want to put those in the Q&A. Um, how long are the giant salamanders? So we want to quickly there, Dee Dee, just uh, I think somebody might have missed how long can they get? How big? I just yeah. looked it up, 330 millimeters. <laughs> <laughs> what is that in in is that what is that in like inches should i know that um maybe a foot a foot long yeah yeah all right and then if someone um this is an apartment or they want to find a place maybe to volunteer or help with habitat restoration projects so maybe they have a chance to finding some amphibians any ideas of groups or places they could go to interact So, I mean, certainly it kind of it does depend on where you are. So I know like there's a project in Portland where they actually move, uh, there's a the pathway for the red-legged frog that um, it's blocked by highways. And so they, they all get together and they catch them in buckets and move them to where they are trying to move to every year. And so that is something you could get involved with. Um, and then as far as there are some, there are some other volunteer efforts that might be better, like could send me a, I'll have my email up at the very end and I could help connect, could help connect folks for sure. Perfect. That Portland one I think is managed through Portland Metro um, and some of the local communities may have um, these sorts of things on the radar. So um, I oh. think we could probably, you know, operate kind of like a switchboard and connect people. 
<laughs> I think so too. And I would say the soil and water conservation districts are another great place to ask about because they do restoration projects um, on uh, working with um, family forest landowners. And so they do a lot of tree planting and um, surveys and just, in fact, the 12, so the Twelton Soil and Water Conservation District would be a great place to reach out to. Perfect. Tiffany, um, how well did the giant salamander salamanders tolerate the electro fishing? Um, very well. Yeah. So with electrofishing, uh, you have currents, you use currents based on the size of the animal that you're trying to catch. And um, so we had it kind of turned to a, a, a lower, a lower frequency so that we could get um, cutthroat trout and these Pacific giants. So we were catching the big ones and um, well, a lot of them. And uh, and it was, it was, they recovered within minutes. So what we were doing is we we're pit tagging them. So we would take them from the stream, put them in a bucket, let them kind of chill out a little bit. And then we would, um, um, we would uh, kind of put them to give them an anesthetic and then put a pit tag in them so that we could keep, go back with a, um, a tele, a, some telemetry equipment and get them uh, and find them and see what that what habitat they were hanging out in after we released them for like six months. It was pretty cool. They did they did good. Short answer. They're fine. Perfect. Well, <laughs> I'm going to um, kind of stop there because I know you have more to present. I want to make sure you have the time to get it in. Please, I encourage everyone to keep putting in your questions. We'll also type in some answers uh, for those that had a couple questions about things like how maybe that salamander and trying to guess what, what it might be. So if some of our speakers have time, they're trying to type in some of your, um, what do you think this might be? And they'll try and answer those for you. So keep those coming in. We'll hopefully have more time at the end. And I'm gonna hand it back over because we don't wanna miss the second half of your presentation and just a time check we have until about 425 ladies. Okay, we'll keep it rolling. So I wanted to say that the next section is um, all about the research and the management, just to remind you. And so they are word heavy, but we're going to walk you through it. So don't be, don't freak out when you see the next slide. That's what I'm saying. It's all you, Didi. Oh, I'm busy writing in the in the, the <laughs> Q and A. Um, research and riparian buffers. Okay, so riparian buffers are one of the main tools for um, cons conservation of Oregon amphibians. And um, these are uh, specifically put around pond habitats and stream habitats for the pond breeding and the stream breeding animals. Um, a riparian buffer is a strip of vegetation that is left along the stream in particular or a pond. Um, and it buffers the water from activities upslope. So if you're in a, um, the streams are really permeating uh, our west side forest, all of our forests really, but on the west side, um, uh, there's so many streams, they're just everywhere. Um, and the forests are draining into these, uh, the water drains into these streams. Um, the stream side buffers um, need to be large enough to provide shading to the water to keep the water temperatures cool. Um, provide litter uh, for the invertebrates that um, they eat the, the litter. So this is part of the food web. Um, provide wood for um, riparian animals to be using as their microclimate refugia, um, as well as stream animals for that um, habitat complexity within streams. Um, the buffers reduce um, erosion, so find sediments going into the stream um, and maintain the water quality as clear, cool water. So there's several functions of riparian buffers. The wider the buffer is, the more um, protection it can offer to that stream by buffering microclimates. So when you do timber harvest upslope of a buffer, you create an edge and that edge um, is um, usually a uh, higher in temperature and lower in moisture when you remove the forest canopy. And that edge effect of dry, warm conditions permeates into the buffer. So the buffer ideally is big enough that it will absorb that or, or act as a buffer to um, 
ameliorate those warm conditions. Again, amphibians really rely on cool, moist conditions. So um, having a buffer wide enough that it provides that, that buffering capacity is needed. And um, the buffers that are mandated on streams are different widths, and it depends on who owns the land and um, how, uh, how wood versus other resources in the forest are are being managed at larger scales. So um, um, in addition to these sort of microhabitat elements of riparian buffers, um, having continuous riparian zones that are, um, are somewhat intact along streams provides a corridor for dispersal for animals. And a lot of the animals, just the stream breeders, as well as pond breeders and terrestrial breeders, um, kind of have their I-5 corridor along streams. So they have these runways up and down these riparian areas. And so intact riparian buffers along streams provides um, dispersal pathways for these animals and not just amphibians, but for other organisms associated with forests as well. So um, I'll leave it there and we can get into more prescriptive things later if, if, that's, if, that's, if there's time and there's a need. Management considerations. So leaving those buffers along um, streams, streams with fish and upper uh, headwater streams that have the amphibians as well. Um, protecting seeps if they're spotty on the landscape. There may be it's, um, amphibians associated with those seeps and wetlands as well. Headwaters, um, we talked a little bit about small streams and headwater streams are up at the um, initiation point of the stream. And this is where species like the torrent salamanders live. They don't live down in the larger streams. They are associated with headwaters. And there's um, an assemblage of animals that can be associated with headwaters. So um, just because there's not fish in the stream, it, they shouldn't be dismissed. And that corridor function is also very important um, because uh, riparian zones that extend into headwaters um, enable animals to get up and over ridgelines. And so you think of it as a funnel, but a funnel going up where animals are have these raceways along the riparian areas along streams and they get up to the small streams and they can go up and over ridgelines. So it provides connectivity across the broader forest landscape. And here we have connectivities. So there's a lot of words on these slides, but um, um, some of the elements for conservation um, in general is to provide redundancy of habitats. So um, in, in the terms of connectivity, provide many corridors. Um, so not just one over ridge pathway, but several. So um, that's why we have riparian buffers on many streams, if not all streams, um, because of that redundancy factor. Um, and uh, larger areas, if you're putting set asides for, air, um, for animals like amphibians, larger areas are better than smaller areas, but redundant areas um, are also beneficial. So in some large watersheds, multiple headwater reserves have been planned, for example, as a um, redundant block of habitat. Still you, Dee, but I can take it if you need a break. So I was trying to remember. I don't want to. I, I think I spoke over <laughs> Tiffany once before. I didn't want to do that again. Oh, very easy. <laughs> don't worry. So here's <laughs> um, an image of a corridor. So um, a lot of those previous slides didn't have really a picture to show what we were talking about. But um, so this is a stream and it's got a buffer around it. So intact um, riparian zone. It's got a wider area and a narrower area. Um, wider is better, but some contexts you may uh, need to have a, a narrower area. Um, the animals are still able to um, to go along these areas. So maintaining cover is is the bottom line. And um, if you provide habitat, then yeah, I think they will come. Um, and so stepping stones over ridge lines also are um, ideas that can be trialed or maintaining downwood. Downwood are runways for small mammals and they are refugia for amphibians. Um, wood can provide connectivity as well. 
So I'll start with uh, the climate change stuff, but um, pretty much climate change is on the top of the list for management considerations for folks um, all over Oregon and the world. Um, but yeah, the, the interesting part about um, planning for uh, climate shifts is that you know, we're, um, we're creating these models that are pretty good at estimating how um, our abiotic uh, factors are going to change. So how much precipitation, when is it going to happen, what are temperatures going to be looking like in the future. And so we're trying to use those models to predict how habitats are going to change over time. And with um, and that can be difficult, uh, but we're getting better at it. And right now, uh, Didi and I are on several projects that are trying to create habitat models that uh, look to see which habitats are going to be the most impacted by climate change. And there's uh, and headwater streams are a big concern. And so um, by creating or managing lands and forests um, to to maintain a lot of these habitats um, over time is the goal, right? And make it so that uh, animal that these habitats don't change so much, dry up so much, get too hot or too cold so much that these amphibians can no longer persist in them. So we are focusing uh, some of our attention on legacy features. So these are things like big, big downed wood, big pieces of wood, right? Because that's where amphibians can go to uh, find refuge when uh, conditions aren't great and then they can come out when they are. So um, legacy features, um, so, and maintaining a diversity of tree species. These are just two strategies that we can do to create these refugia habitats or micro refugia that can help uh, these amphibians persist. Um, and and by, by microclimate, so, so climate, right, that's the big kind of regional precipitation and temperature stuff that we're going to be getting over the next 50, 100 years. Um, our models uh, are pretty good at 50 year intervals. And then we've got um, microclimates, right? So microclimates are what's happening right on the ground. So right near that piece of downed wood or right near that stump or in this clump of trees. And how can we keep microclimates like in these forests um, to be uh, consistent and stable and, and uh, suitable for amphibians? And so of course you can imagine if you're a frog or a salamander, you're gonna want a microclimate that's cool and wet. So what can we do on the ground that maintains cool and wet? Right, so we keep uh, canopy as much as we possibly can. We and and closed canopy. We keep lots of um, down wood on the ground because that uh, the temperatures um, around and in down wood are actually really stable. Um, if there is a, a harvest, timber harvest, then having a lot of that down wood can be um, a lifesaver for a lot of these forest associated wildlife, including amphibians. Um, I just did a project where we put temperature probes inside downed wood um, in clear cuts and in the open, in, in close canopy forest. And inside the wood, it was really protective. Uh, that's, uh, those are places where the temperatures stay, stayed well within the range of what can maintain um, healthy amphibians. So that down wood is super important and big down wood, right? Because the bigger it is, the more stable it is in terms of temperature and the more moisture it retains. So um, the forest practices rules for Oregon, uh, when you do harvest, you got to leave wood on the ground. Right now, I think it's two large pieces per acre. Um, and that wood, uh, it should remain undisturbed or, and the stuff that is down needs to remain undisturbed. Um, and we're, we, it's the bigger, the better, the, the large diameter down logs, um, distributed across that harvest unit is super important. So instead of like pulling them all together into slash piles, keep those things separate, keep it, keep it, cover as much ground as you possibly can insulate that ground, um, especially after a harvest with, with down wood. Um, keep the stumps, the stumps are so important. We're really trying to figure out survey techniques where we don't tear apart stumps. Cause it used to be when you were looking for salamanders, you'd have a potato rake in one hand and, and you just start ripping apart these stumps. We can't rip apart stumps. Stumps are really essential, vital habitat for a lot of our plethodonids, a lot of just amphibians in general. 
And so we need to uh, keep those on the ground. And if there's a if there's a part of that tree that's um, that you, that you can't take to the mill and it's unmerchandisable, then you got to keep keep it on the ground. You know, the big stuff and the little stuff because that can be really great for regeneration of plants, regenerate and maintain maintenance of the microclimate and habitat for these for these amphibians and snacks. We love snacks. Everybody loves snacks. Wildlife loves snacks. I think that's true. And then we want to, um, you know, we've got these big legacy material on the ground now. There's there's quite, a, you know, there's some of it out there and we want to, like Tiffany said, protect that as, as much as possible. But then as we're growing new trees, which we're doing a lot of that as well, um, be thinking about what is your, what is the next generation of legacy trees going to look like is, you know, so identifying those wildlife trees on the ground now, or, you know, standing wildlife trees and be like, cool, I'm going to leave that one. And I know it's going to grow to be, you know, this massive tree, it'll eventually fall to the forest floor and become future amphibian habitat. So, um, and then, right, these, uh, I just want to say something else about that unmerged stuff. It is so tempting to kind of clean everything up in the forest and, and make, uh, and habitat piles are good. Some of you have heard me talk about habitat piles and I and how important they are and, and they're great. But today we're focused on um, amphibians. And so when we're just thinking about amphibians, you know, keeping that stuff messy and spread out um, is also good. So it's, it's a balancing act for sure when you're managing for multiple species, but, um, but messy is okay. Um, and so we kind of went through a lot of that management stuff uh, pretty, oh, what is going on? I just hit the button. There we go. Are you seeing the summary? Okay, good. I saw that it looked really weird there for a second. So, you know, we we introduced you to the amphibians in Oregon and I and I threw up a couple of the, the photos there and the habitat so you could kind of re remind yourself what those looked like. And then um, just really going through all that science, it really, um, the science does support the importance of managing in a way that, that benefits amphibians. We've got a lot of research that highlights the importance of those riparian areas and, and keeping those for amphibians. Um, and then as, as the participants in this, um, in this seminar today, you know, I, you, you want to be thinking about, well, what does that look like on my property? Do I have any ponded habitats? Do I have any riparian areas? What are the things that I can do um, to keep, you know, to allow those amphibians to persist through, through time on my property, especially given the threats that are coming down at them? Um, you know, do I have downed wood? How can I recruit downed wood? Can I keep it? Um, you know, are there any projects that you could implement on your property that would benefit amphibians? And then I don't know if it's come across from all three of us, but I think it has. We want as much downwood as possible in as many places as possible for amphibians to really help them um, persist through time. So I believe that that was kind of the note we wanted to end on, and we are really quite willing to take um, questions. Well, thanks again. I think that was really helpful to uh, have both more about the Fimians and then thinking about their habitats and how we can help promote them and things we could do on the land. We've had some great questions, uh, a lot of interactions, and just thought we'd bring a few of these out to everyone. Um, on our forest land, we have ponds that dry up from July to October. Will that severely limit the number of species that can live there compared to year round water? No, keep the intermittent ponds. Intermittent ponds and wetlands are fantastic because these are pond breeding amphibians, the ones that we're, we talked about today. They're out of there, man. By June and July, they've metamorphosed and moved on. And if the more the more permanent your water is, the more chance you're gonna get bullfrogs because bullfrogs need permanent water. So they'll move in and they'll eat everything. So keep it intermittent. In fact, if you wanna get rid of bullfrogs, and I saw that was a question, if you wanna get bullfrogs, make it an intermittent pond. You know, there's there's ways of doing that and it's really helpful for amphibians. You'll get a lot more amphibians laying their eggs there if you don't have fish and um, if, if uh, it dries up in the late summer. Um, it can dry up too early. That's that you can strand tadpoles in a pond and that dries up too early. That's not good either, but um, it, if, it sounds like your pond is, is right on for maintaining really healthy amphibians. Great. So Fran, do you want to add anything more? There's a question about how important are unburned slash piles or clumps of smaller logs for providing habitat as opposed to larger wood? 
kind of our uh, dinner plate, maybe. Oh yeah, that okay. I thought that's what you're getting at. So, so my brother has done a publication on on burning slash, and he did let me have a little. Um, actually, it's not just my brother. I give him credit, and Julie was hugely involved, and so were a lot of other people. But it was one of the ones that I got to work with my brother on, so I thought that was cool. Um, and and you know, and I do like to burn slash. I've gotten the opportunity to do that on my parents' property. And so what we like to say is, if it if the log would fit on your dinner plate, then it should not be in a slash pile. Please keep that out of the slash pile for not only for amphibians, but like Dee Dee mentioned, their um, runways for small mammals, they're important for so many things. I totally get that we're gonna be burning slash out there. We've got fire risk, we've got to create planting spots for our little baby trees, you know, and I heart baby trees too, but from the amphibian standpoint, the keep that slash on the ground um, for them. If, it, if it's bigger than a dinner plate, bigger, dinner plate or bigger, don't burn it. It's our rule of thumb. <laughs> All right. And then I thought this was an interesting, someone mentioned that their forest has a robust population of mountain beaver, the boomers, which make massive tunnel networks on our slopes and near seeps. How important are kind of these underground tunnels for amphibian habitat? Anyone want to take? They're essential. Question? They're right. really essential. Um, not just the, the boomer um, burrows, but mammal burrows in general. Most of the amphibians don't actually dig. They use existing cracks and crevices, um, existing burrows, or um, interstitial spaces in rocky slopes. Um, you know, a lot of the salamanders look like worms because they're noodling through these areas. Um, and uh, so an example, um, so I've studied Western toads in the Cascade Range. And I would hear the males doing their release call, which is what they do when another male grabs them underground. And it sounded like beep, 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 beep. And all I could see were these mammal burrows. Um, and I just finally, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. And I stuck my arm all the way in as far as it would go. And I pulled out three toads. Um, so um, they're using these refugia underground, um, maybe as overwintering hibernacula um, or as um, dispersal areas even as well. I think every single amphibian in Oregon is using burrows of mammals. And I think there's a commensalism also between amphibians and mammals. And um, the overwintering is something that we don't know very much about, but I think it's critical um, for us to maintain the mammals, to keep those spaces, maintain the trees. The rotting tree roots are essentially tunnels underground as well over time. Um, and these, this is the you know unseen habitat for a lot of these organisms, and I think they're all using it. Um, an example, um, someone in California, they sunk PVC pipes down into the ground and they but they had holes drilled in the side of the PVC pipes and spacers put in so whatever would go in a hole wouldn't go up and down and after time they removed the PVC pipes and they found amphibians um, six yards down into the substrate That's... yeah so I think that that underground world is really critical and um, not just boomers but even mice um, have burrows like that. They have tunnels. You see it in the Cascades when the snow melts. You'll see these little tunnels along the um, the surface of the ground. Those are areas that not just them they are using, but everyone. But I would not suggest to anyone else that they stick their arm down a hole because you might come out with something different. <laughs> Especially if it's a mountain beaver hole that somebody might have put a trap in. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah. Or, of course, um, reptiles use holes as well, and we don't have many rattlesnakes on, on the west side at least, but you never know what you're going to come up with. <laughs> Good disclaimer. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to take a minute and thank you all uh, for presenting today. A lot of great information, and I know uh, I enjoyed that, that talk. Just wanted to encourage people, you have questions, please keep typing those in. We'll take some more time to do those. We also want to um, thank you for joining us today and to remind you that we have another Tree School Online will come up next month. So we do these uh, the second Tuesday of each month. And so Tuesday, February 8th, we're going to have Amanda Rao, who will be with the Oregon Department of Forestry about prescribed fire in Oregon. So um, very timely and thinking about uh, if you're doing forest management or how you might want to get involved in these type of projects that we know are really important in Oregon. So I encourage you to 
uh, go in and register for that or check out some of the other tree school online. But we can go uh, back here to our questions. And, you know, we noticed today that, right, a lot of uh, people that were joining us are forest land owners, but some others might live more in the city and just have a real interest in amphibians. So what can we do to address these issues in the inner city? So you gave recommendations for if you have forest land, but any ideas for people in the inner city or um, maybe especially in those neighborhoods? So a lot of the cities have um, parks or forested set-asides and these are areas where um, amphibians can live. For example, I think just east of Portland, there's a park that is well known for organ slender salamanders. It used to be that forest um, had continued from the Cascade Range over into um, this area, but as people have come in, they've they created farms and have broken up that forest. But there's a remnant population of organ slender salamanders that appears really disjunct in, an, in a weird place. But that's an example that if you have habitat in cities, then um, these amphibians can live there. Red-legged frogs live in Portland, for example. Um, tree frogs are very resilient and can live in a lot of places if they have breeding habitat, as well as upland that they, they can go to. Um, you won't get everything in a city, but you can get some. Thanks. Uh, yeah, some people have, uh, you know, leave messy yards too, and maybe keep some leaf litter as people are moving through. Um, so someone else, Elizabeth asked, how can we homeowners in the high desert areas promote amphibian habitat? We live in the eastern part of Oregon in Sherman County. We have found toads in the yard. So any ideas for some of our eastern Oregon landowners? And yeah, so and this is not just for Eastern Oregon, but for, for anywhere. Um, there's a couple initiatives that are happening in other places like the like Great Britain, the Million Ponds Project, um, creating ponds. If you create ponds that are suitable for amphibian breeding, then you can get amphibian uh, breeding, pond breeding amphibians there. And logs, they, they just don't need the, the breeding habitat. They need some place to go um, when they're not breeding. So maintaining cool, moist areas outside of that. So if you create the habitat, then, um, then you can get animals there. So I, I would say ponds and many people in Eastern Oregon have, um, have a pond on their property for other purposes, but um, it just takes a little thought and you can create the habitat for the animals as well. Thanks, CD. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap, uh, launch the wrap up poll as we are getting some more questions in. People are uh, finding a lot of useful information. I think now asking you to try and figure out every animal they've ever seen that could have been an amph amphibian. Uh, Fran's recommending to you to get an amphibian. Uh, of amphibian guidebook. There's a lot of there them, but go. I just have to, this one is just amphibians of Washington, Oregon. Um, I actually got this when I graduated from high school as a, a gift. I think they must have known then what I was going into. So that was, there's probably better ones available now. This was 1996, but I still use it. You can see all my little tabs and like, I still bring this into the woods and um, it's seen, you know, it, it's a, it's a coveted. Yeah. Then that one's a really good one too. So, you know, even, even. Dr. This Olson is a good beginner book. Um, yeah. And there's a new edition just out in 2021. Um, this one is by Corcoran and Toms, and it's um, if you're new to amphibians, it's it's got tabs in the upper corner that are color coded, and um, so it's it's a good starter. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, this one has other chapters with other information, um, <laughs> and I'm a co-author. So. And not, <laughs> she wrote that one. It's awesome. It is awesome. I have to agree that that's a great one. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead julie sorry about that no that's great uh 
That's awesome. Great suggestions. And I'll just put in a plug too to get the Ofri book. So if you want to see more about the recommendations about the species, those great maps we shared at the beginning, those are all in the wildlife uh, advantage forest, the forest amphibians book, which we're excited to just release and want to thank the three of them, Tiffany, Dee Dee, and Fran for all the work they put into that publication and for coming on today and share. I know you all have busy schedules and Tiffany's uh, out there. If you, anyone can notice at OSU, uh, even brought in the old blackboard just in case she has to go back to that type of old school. So we know you're busy and all of you have a lot going on with all your research. So really appreciate it. Uh, appreciate those that wrap up polls up there. And I think a lot of people have given us feedback. So thanks for um, answering those three questions. And then um, one like, another question that came in it says, do um, soil and water conservation districts, their backyard habitat programs consider amphibians or is it just bird or, or pollinators? I don't know if any of you might know the answer to that or that might be some homework for us to, to find that out. out. Alicia, any? So we'll, we'll see if we can find that out. Or your, I would encourage you to call your local soil and water conservation district if you have an interest because they really have some great programs. So that's a great question. And, and again, another plug for connecting locally I, with some questions. I think it probably Brand. depends, Julie, on, on which, which district one? you're working with. I know Tualatin does for some of theirs because I created a monitoring program for them. And so we were definitely, amphibians was one of the things that we were looking at. So um, so it, for sure, it it is sometimes considered <laughs> and it should always be considered but it's shockingly amphibians are not always on people's radar which is weird <laughs> as does this, the pollinator group said a similar thing so uh many years ago and then they got some traction so you're getting there tiffany <laughs> Well, I appreciate again, everybody, and coming in today, and a lot of great questions. I think over 30 questions and comments and a lot of great discussion. So appreciate all the time uh, and appreciate, again, everybody, Alicia, for helping out behind the scenes and everyone's uh, being involved and for your time today. So I'll pause to see. I don't see any more questions coming in. So I'll give um, an opportunity if any of you have some last words you'd like to share about amphibians or any last things, thoughts that you've had from all the questions or something from the presentation, I'll hand it over to you three for our wrap up. I think the only thing I would add is that just uh, that I'm in, in awe of my co-presenters, Dr. Garcia and Dr. Olson are just in, what a wealth of knowledge. And I, you know, working on this um, publication with them, I learned so much and even learned more today. So I sure appreciate um, the two of you being here with us. Um, I, I'll just add that um, also thank you to the co-presenters and um, I think as we went through and we realized that we're going to run out of time there was information on some of those last slides that you could just go back and read and um, and it may reinforce what actually we were saying very quickly as we went through those last ones but I think our passion was certainly there with the the animals um, at the beginning so um, our emails, I think, are on the, the previous slide and the slides will be posted. So do not hesitate to um, contact any of us. If you have further questions, um, we'll fit you in. No worries. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we're, out, we're we love to talk amphibians. So if you ever have a picture of one that you need help identifying, just send it along. And if I can't tell, then there's like 50 people that I talk to on a daily basis that has, have pretty good ideas. So. We can help you out with that. Well, thanks again, everybody. We really appreciate you coming and learning about amphibians, hearing from our experts about the role the forest play in providing the habitat for these amphibians and what you can do to help provide those management recommendations. So uh, come visit us on the next Tree School online and check out some of our recorded webinars. And this will be up in about a week if you want to go back and take a look again at some of those slides and information. And the as speaker said, they have their, their email addresses there. So if anything else comes to mind, please feel free to reach out. So thanks again, everyone, for coming tonight. And we hope you all have a good evening. <laughs>